Merry Christmas. You ready? Are your shopping done? Been out, buying things, at the mall, the stores? If you haven't been, you're one of the few that hasn't been. I read some statistics this week from uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs that estimated the number of people that were out shopping on Black Friday, you know, when Black Friday is, it's the Friday after Thanksgiving, was 133,700,000 people were out shopping on Black Friday. Friday. Some of you had to be there. The, probably the most amazing statistic was that they estimated that 23 percent of that 133 million 700,000 people, somewhere around 30 million, give or take a million either way, were there before the stores opened. This is desperate shopping time. This is, this is shopping exaggeration. The uh, Department of Consumer Affairs also estimates that this year, in 2017, the consumer financial activity for the month of November and December will be at an all-time high. They are estimating that we Americans will spend between 670 and 700 billion dollars on goods and services and gifts in the month of November and December. That's up from 10 years ago in 2007 from 550 billion to almost 700 billion dollars now. And if that wasn't enough, sort of addictive spending, we actually invented a day called Cyber Monday. The people who invented the internet, Al Gore and his friends, have decided <laughs> that, uh, that the Monday after Thanksgiving shall be called Cyber Monday, and, and all of these internet uh, retailers have sales. I don't know if you bought anything on Cyber Monday, but they estimate that Cyber Monday produced 6.6 .6 billion dollars in sales in one day online. Now it's easy for us to look at these sort of uh, over the top exaggerated consumer statistics and say we've lost our minds. We've lost track of the, the meaning of Christmas. We have, we have become hedonistic and materialistic and consumeristic lemmings who just go out and buy things for no reason. How much can anyone possibly spend in one season? And it's easy for us to, to cloister ourselves in this sacred space and say we remember, we remember the real meaning of Christmas. But in the midst of all of that, consumerism is the real meaning of Christmas. You see, it's, it's still there. If you look at the numbers, this is the most generous time of the year. If you know people who are in nonprofit work or in charity work, or if you support people who are in nonprofit work or charity work, like I do, I get emails and, and requests and end of the year giving requests from the organizations we support and the people we support in nonprofit work and nonprofit ministry. We get appeals because they know at this time of the year there's a spirit of generosity that pervades our culture. People are, as a rule, just nicer and kinder and more thoughtful. Our attitudes shift. And while we may wish this was true all of the year, the reality is that spirit of gratitude and that spirit of generosity is part of that expression of spending that we see making all the headlines. If you haven't gotten a letter from me yet asking for money, it, it's coming. Because, because we understand that in this season, there is a reminder that it's about being generous. That you cannot separate the Christmas story from a story of generosity. And all of it traces back to one of the most misunderstood stories in the entire Bible. The story in the second chapter of Matthew, the story of the Magi. And it goes back to three small gifts that the Magi presented the newborn Savior, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Throughout the years, countless sermons have been preached on the significance of these three gifts. I've preached my share of sermons about the significance of gold and frankincense and myrrh. But this Christmas season, I want to talk about the gift behind the gifts. The most significant gift that any of us can give 
or the most significant gift that any of us can receive, the true gift of Christmas. I want us to spend this Christmas season focusing on that. But before we talk about that anymore, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, that you would use your words spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to remind us of uh, the necessity of generosity and the greatness of your gift to us and the pleasure and the blessing of giving that gift to others. Pray that we would remember that during these weeks and all year, for I ask that for myself and for my family and for all of us here. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we're all familiar. Is everybody familiar with the story of the Magi, the, the story of the uh, kings from the east who came and paid tribute to the infant Jesus? I think we all understand it, but we don't realize how little of what we know of that story is actually true, is actually in the story. There's more that we don't know about these magi than we do know. We, we don't know their ages. We don't know whether they were young or old. We don't know whether they, they were all men or men and women. We, do, we don't know exactly where they were from. Then we know they were from the east, probably ancient Babylon or Persia or somewhere in Central Asia. But we don't know exactly where they were from. We don't even know how many of them there were. We like to think there were three of them because we wrote songs about it. You know, we three kings of Orion are, we saw three ships come sailing in, and, and there's three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we just do the math and say, well, there had to be three of them. Larry, Moe, and Curly, they showed up at the manger, but, but we don't know. We just know that there was more than one, because magi is plural. There could have been two, or there could have been 20. And we don't know how they saw this star. We know there were probably astronomers, but were they astrologers? Were they shaman? Were they, were they able to predict the future? How out of all of the people living on the earth, especially the people in the, in the people of God, the Jewish people, were, was it these guys, these people, who discovered this astrological or astronomical phenomenon and said, we've got, we've got to go and, and see what this is about? Who were these guys? We don't know what their beliefs were. We don't know what their practices were. We don't know how long it took them from the time they made that celestial observation to say, we should go find out where this is. We don't know how long it took them to travel there. We don't know exactly when they arrived. We like to think that they showed up at the manger because we all have those nativity sets. And the coolest part of the nativity set are those kings on their camels. They're like the fanciest part of the set. And sometimes you get one that's like kneeling down and presenting a gift. But we don't know. They probably didn't show up at the manger. It's not like Joseph and Mary moved in. They said, this is a nice barn. Let's stay here. Probably the day after the birth, they probably said, we got to get a real place to stay. So they probably didn't find him at the manger. We don't know how long it was. It was probably a year or two after his birth that these wise men, these magi, showed up. But of all the things that we don't know about them, we do know that they brought gifts as an offering. They brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. But that was not the most significant gift that they gave. The most significant gift that the Magi gave is the most significant gift that any one of us can give. It is the most significant gift that any one of us can get. The most significant present that we can present to anyone is our presence. What mattered most was that they showed up. That they brought gifts was only slightly less important than their presence there. Because in their presence, they were communicating their faith, they were communicating their hope, and they were communicating their love. And this is the greatest gift we can receive or give in this season. What I've learned from the Magi and studying the Magi was, was an unexpected truth about the presence of faith in my life. You see, what they were doing by coming and presenting these gifts, their presence at, at the birth of the Savior, their presence in the life of this newborn king 
was an expression of their belief. They were sharing their faith. And I don't know how many of you are like me, but when I hear the, the, the idea of sharing my faith, there's a, there's a paradigm that I think of. It's a paradigm that I was taught. It was the paradigm that I was trained in. And many of you were probably exposed to the same methodology. That sharing my faith was an important discipline in following Christ, an important part of my spiritual life, along with prayer and Bible study and worship and the fellowship and communion of the saints, was the idea that a spiritual discipline was for me to share my faith. We called it evangelism. And I did all kinds. I did every kind of it. I know the Romans road and the four spiritual laws, and I've learned how to share my testimony. I've handed out tracts on street corners. I've literally stood on a soapbox with a megaphone and preached the gospel. I've shared my faith with people on airplanes and in trains and in automobiles. I've buttonholed and pigeonholed people all across the country, all around the world, asking them about their faith. And this is how I was taught to share my faith. And it always bothered me because it never seemed to be enough. It never seemed to be enough that I could talk someone into believing that God was dependent on me convincing them. I always thought, what, what am I missing? And it's what I find in the rep, in the Magi. You see, the Magi were sharing their faith. They were expressing their belief. And I want to share three radical observations that I've learned from the Magi about what it means to truly share our faith, to express our belief. The first one is, I learned from the Magi that expressing my faith, expressing my belief, means I'm supposed to acknowledge the faith of others. An important part of sharing our faith is acknowledging the faith of others. If I want my faith to be present in my relationships, I have to acknowledge the faith of others. I mean, what did the Magi believe? What did they believe? We don't know. We know they were probably pagan astrologers. They were people who looked at the heavens and discerned from the movement of the stars and the planets things about the future, things about their, the, their culture and their civilization, about people's lives. They were astrologers. They were, they, they were tarot card readers. There was a tradition in, in their culture that they could predict the future by examining the droppings of goats. That's what these guys were. They, were. they were priests of a pagan religion. They would not have fit in at the Baptist Fellowship potluck. In fact, they wouldn't have been comfortable hanging out with Methodists or Presbyterians or, or the Catholics. They wouldn't have even fit in with the Unitarians. And everybody fits in with them. But these guys were so far off the beaten path that they were worshiping stars and animals and making all kinds of sacrifices. Their belief system was nothing like that of Joseph and Mary or the Savior they came to worship. But what I learned from the Magi was they had the same cry in their heart that I have. They are searching for the same things that we are. They're searching for answers. They're searching for clues. They're searching for explanations. They're searching to connect with something that's greater than themselves. And the cry of their heart is exactly the same as the cry of ours. And even though their practice may be uncomfortable for us or unfamiliar to us, it comes from the same place inside their soul. And if you want to share your faith with someone, share that. Acknowledge the faith of others. I know what you say. You say, well, there's so many people out there that believe in so many wacky and weird things. There are people that believe in bigotry and hatred and prejudice and violence. What am I supposed to do? I'm not saying you affirm them in that. I'm saying you acknowledge that I understand the cry of your heart. Because the cry of your heart and the cry of my heart are the same. And I think you may have lost your way, but we are on the same path. Two years ago, uh, Riverbender, a friend of ours here at Riverbend, who was the executive producer of a film, invited us to a premiere here in Austin. And my family went with she and her husband to this premiere. 
She was the executive producer of a film because she had been the lead researcher in a book written by a man named Lawrence Wright called Going Clear. It was a documentary, it became a documentary produced by HBO that won three Emmy Awards and a Peabody Award. It was a documentary about Scientology and she was the lead researcher and executive producer of this film and we went to the film. And I remember sitting in the Paramount and watching, watching this documentary and shaking my head and thinking, what kind of lunatics believe this stuff? Because the case that they made was so compelling and it was so convicting, I thought, is, are these people just idiots? Are they just blind? And so I remember walking out of, of the theater and running into her, and, and she had spent time with many of these people and spent years in research, and I remember asking her, how can people believe this stuff? Are they just stupid? And she said, no, they're just like us. They're searching for the same things we are. They're sincere in their beliefs may not agree with what they believe in, but we can acknowledge the faith that they have. That's what it means when the rabbi came and showed up at the feet of the newborn king. This is what I learned from the rabbi, from the magi about, about expressing my faith, about sharing my beliefs. That first of all, I have to acknowledge the faith of others. The second thing that I have to do is, is I have to affirm my faith in others. I have to affirm the faith or my faith in others. Any of you have children or grandchildren? How many Christmas pageants, programs, or musicals are you going to in the next month? Two, three, four, a dozen? I mean, if you're like us, when my kids were little, there were times in the Christmas season when we would go to a half a dozen of these excruciatingly, painfully boring Christmas productions, especially when they were in preschool and then in elementary school. And I have videotape of all of this because as a father, I thought it was my responsibility to record for posterity every moment of them standing on the stage, mouthing the words, standing next to a little boy who was picking his nose in between the two girls who were pulling each other's hair, and I have video of all of it, hours and hours of video. And 30 years after taking it, I have never watched a moment of it. I'm thinking about some Christmas and bringing my kids over to the house and saying, I'm going to make you watch all of this because we had to sit through it. <laughs> why do we do that? Why do, why do we show up at their ball games and their recitals? Why do we, why do we, why do we go to their, to their science fair projects and, and, and to their, their, their demonstrations and their, and, and their Christmas musicals? because we understand something important about our presence in their life. It affirms them. Just by being there, we are affirming their value to us, their significance to us. We understand that. You want to share your beliefs with someone else, affirm their value to you. Assure, affirm your faith in them. Affirm them that they are valuable by being fully present with them. You know, we have a tendency to think of the Christmas story as theater. That Mary and Joseph, they were just actors. They were playing a role. And the shepherds, they were just, you know, uh, bit part actors, character actors from, from the Hollywood uh, casting studio. That these weren't real people. But I prefer to imagine that Mary and Joseph were just like me. And that even though they had a moment when an angel appeared to them and they had the promises of God, that once they got some distance from those moments, they began to go, was that real? Did that really happen? Did an angel really talk to me? Am I really pregnant with the Messiah? And then all of the antagonism in that journey over the nine months of their pregnancy, the, the disgrace, and then the dislocation, and they had to travel to Bethlehem. And then she gives birth in a stable. Because I would be crying out, hey, God, a little help here. I'm not looking for a suite at the Four Seasons, but a room with a door would be nice. This is the Savior of the world. You told us that. And as time passed, I'm sure that they wondered they had to. They had to be confused and lonely and afraid. 
And then these guys showed up. These magi show up in their life and they say, we're here because what's happening to you is real. Because what's going on in your life is valuable and important. And they affirm them by their presence. You want to know what it means to share what you believe? You share what you believe by being fully present. There's a threadbare statement that I don't even like repeating, but it's absolutely true, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It is our presence. It is being fully present in the lives of those in need, being fully present in one another's lives, that we affirm their value. And that's what it means to share your faith, is to affirm the faith that you see in them. Affirm your faith in them. Every psychological study that I've ever seen on parenting in 40 years, every study I have ever seen said children value time with their parents more than the things they get from their parents. Because this is how we affirm the value of someone, is through our presence. You want to share what you believe, be fully present with those in need, be fully present with those around you, be fully present with your family. Acknowledge the shared faith, acknowledge the faith of, the, of others, affirm your faith in others, and finally, I want you to apply his faith to others. I think we all are familiar with when Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. It also means what you do for the least of these, you do for me. What you do with the least of these, you do with me. This is, this is what we do. This is, this, is what, this is what it means to share our faith, is to apply him to the lives of others and for the lives of others and with the lives of others. You see, I'm really sorry. I have to apologize to people that I've taught over the years that I, that I was just doing what I was told. I was taught that sharing my faith meant, meant, meant confrontation, meant having an argument, meant making a convincing case for belief. And that if I did something, an act of kindness, if I gave someone a sandwich or, or we helped someone in need, that was a means to an end. It was a means to have the right to have a conversation so that I might convince them of what I believe. But that's not enough. That's not what it means to share my faith. What it means to share my faith is I serve you because of what I believe, not whether or not you agree. See, the way that I like to say it is, I used to think that the sandwich was the means to presenting the gospel, and now I believe that the sandwich is the gospel. I like the way St. Augustine said it. St. Augustine said, always preach the gospel, but only when necessary, use words. You see, what we believe comes out in how we behave. It is an inseparable correlation. And so we apply his faith to others, for others, and with others. These are three lessons that I learned about what it means to express my faith, to be present in my faith from the Magi. I learned to acknowledge the faith of others and, and to affirm my faith in others and to apply his faith to others others. I was taught a very different methodology. I was taught that sharing my faith was confrontational. The goal was conversion. That if I could make the case for Christ convincingly enough that you would adopt my belief system and, and come with me on the journey to heaven. And that served me well for decades. That served me well because it, it made me very articulate about what I believe. It gave me a great sense of an ability to defend my faith. But it wasn't enough. I didn't realize that what was the greatest gift I could give was not a conversation, but my presence. By making myself available, I was the gospel. 
in this season of generosity and gratitude. It's, it's that it all began with those magi who showed up. And they worshipped the one that they believed was the promised Messiah, the king, the savior of the world. And they presented him with three simple gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But what I want us to celebrate during this time of gift giving and in this season of generosity is the greatest gift we have been given, which is his presence. And the greatest gift we can give is the presence of faith and hope and love in our lives. The greatest present we can present is in our presence. So go shop for some of that, why don't you? I mean, I, I mean, I understand that the, the generosity and, and gift giving in this time of year is important. And, and while I was researching, I, I thought I could help you out because I discovered some interesting statistics about what people want for Christmas. There's a recent study. It was taken just last week. And they surveyed Americans and said, what are the top five things on your Christmas wish list? And among 18 to 29-year-olds, the top five things on their Christmas wish list, number one was clothes and shoes. I'm convinced they ask more girls than boys about what their gifts were. But number one, 23% of them said the number one thing they want for Christmas is clothes or shoes. Number two was computers. This is when the boys chimed in. Number three was consumer electronics. Number four were games and toys. And number five was food and liquor. I can tell by your laughter, you're saying, boy, that would have been higher on my list. <laughs> but the, but that, that was the top five among 18 to 29-year-olds. What was fascinating was among 30 to 59-year-olds, the list was almost the same, except food and liquor rose on the list. <laughs> and there was a new number one. And the new number one was almost twice what any other one, any other item on the list of 18 to 29 year olds was. 43% of those 30 to 59 said what they wanted on their Christmas wish list. Number one thing was nothing. But as interesting as that is, it was even more interesting, the profile of people 60 and above. People 60 and above had no item of all of the items that people mentioned as wanting to be part of their Christmas list that was above 11%, except for one thing, 73% of them. So the number one thing I want on my Christmas list is nothing. Now the cynic in me interprets that as, of course, the older you get, the more you have, the less you need. So what do you put on your list? Well, I've got all that I want. I really don't want anything. Or the older you get, the more expensive the stuff is that you would put on your list. And it's embarrassing to say the number one thing on my list is a Ferrari. <laughs> and not a toy Ferrari, a real Ferrari, a $200,000 Ferrari. So rather than be embarrassed, you say, well, there's nothing that I want. But what I hope it represents, what I hope it represents, is that we grow older and as we grow wiser, like the wise men who came to worship at the feet of the newborn savior, that as we get older, we realize the most significant gifts are not things. The most significant thing that we can receive is the presence of people we care about and love and the presence that we can have in the lives of those that matter. This is what we should be shopping for. So have fun shopping and have a Merry Christmas.